This video will go through the key concepts of unit 3.6 efficiency ratios. This is an HL only topic, meaning it is more likely to show up in the section A of paper two. You need good understanding of unit 3.4 on final accounts to be able to calculate and interpret these ratios. So make sure to review those concepts first. In this topic, our focus will be at various metrics that look at how well the business uses its resources to earn income. And this can be used to help managers figure out how to improve the firm's operating efficiency. Firms that are more efficient tend to be more profitable. There are four efficiency ratios that you need to know, and they will all be given to you on your final exam on the formula sheet, as well as if you have a test on finance at school. The first one is the stock turnover ratio. This calculates how long it takes the firm to sell all of its inventory. And we can measure this in two ways. The first way is to measure the stock turnover in number of days. This just means how many days it takes for a firm to sell all of its stock. And this is calculated by average stock divided by cost of sales times 365. For a business, the lower this number, the better. The other method is the number of times or how many times in a year a firm sells all of its stock. And this is calculated by cost of sales divided by average stock. The higher this number, the better for the business. To improve this ratio, the firm can consider various strategies that can help them lower the amount of stock that they hold, which can also help lower costs. For example, the firm can dispose of old stock or offer a narrower range of more popular products to help reduce the total stock held. So they're not holding inventory for products that are not as popular. It is important for a firm not to hold too much stock as this is the most difficult current asset to turn into cash. It is the least liquid current asset. Remember that term that we discussed in the previous video on liquidity ratios. As a result, this can cause working capital challenges for the business. And we'll go into more detail on this concept in unit 3.7, which is the next topic. The next ratio is the debtor days ratio. Now this is calculating the average number of days it takes a business to collect on its debts. This is typically from customers who have bought goods and services on trade credit, but have not paid the business back yet. This is calculated by debtors divided by sales revenue times 365. Uh, and the unit here is days. So make sure you don't just write the number like 27.28, that you write 27.28 days. Otherwise, you will lose a mark. The shorter the debtor days ratio, the better for the business, as it means they have more quickly collected on their debts from customers. To improve the debtor days ratio, firms can encourage customers to pay by cash, such as by offering a cash discount or tightening the credit period, which is how long customers have to pay back the business. The next ratio is the creditor days ratio, and this calculates the average number of days it takes for a business to pay back its debts. So you can think of this as kind of the opposite of the debtor days, so debtor days and creditor days. The business typically needs to pay back its debts to suppliers who have already provided goods and services to the business. This is typically raw materials, uh, but the business has not paid them back yet. Remember that this is also classified as a source of finance called trade credit, which is covered in unit 3.2. This ratio is calculated by the creditors divided by cost of sales times 365. The longer the creditor days ratio, the better for the business, as it means they have a longer credit period and therefore longer to pay back their creditors. To improve the creditor days ratio, firms can negotiate an extended credit period with their suppliers or in a more extreme case, seek alternative suppliers that offer better credit terms. This allows the business to be more flexible in how it uses its cash because it gets to keep this cash for longer. The last ratio is called the gearing ratio, and this measures the extent to which a firm is financed by loan capital. This helps the business understand how reliant they are on loan capital as a source of finance to fund their business operations. It is calculated by non-current liabilities divided by capital employed. And recall that this capital employed is the same capital employed that we use to calculate the return on capital employed ratio from the previous video. It is the equity section of the balance sheet, which is our retained profits and share capital, plus non-current liabilities. A benchmark here is about 50%. Anything more than this number, meaning if a firm is reliant on um, loan capital for at least half of its financing or more, might mean that the firm is overly reliant on loan capital, and this would leave them vulnerable to an increase in interest rates, uh, which would obviously result in them having to pay back more interest, thereby reducing their retained profit. To improve the gearing ratio, a firm either needs to reduce its non-current liabilities, 
such as by using its excess cash to pay off long-term loans, or to rely more on other sources of finance, like retain profits or share capital. So the business might um, go through a new share issuance to raise share capital, or it might uh, pay less dividends uh, and, and retain more of the profits instead. For walkthroughs on the different ways these ratios can come up during the exam or the different tricks that your teacher or the IB might throw at you, check out the quantitative skills videos on our website. The best way to practice the concepts in this video is to do a lot of practice case studies to familiarize yourself with how this can get asked. Also note that these ratios have a higher chance of showing up, not just on the paper two, but also on the paper three, which is for HO only. So in the paper three, rather than just calculating the ratios, you might be given information on the changes in these ratios and have to use that information in your response. So of course, understanding how to calculate these ratios is important, but understanding the interpretation of these ratios is equally as important uh, and may also be helpful in your IA. The last concept in this topic has to do with insolvency versus bankruptcy. Insolvency occurs when the business can't pay its existing debts when they are due. Now, this is a temporary condition that may or may not impact the firm in the long run. And this really depends on whether they can eventually pay the debt back or not. Bankruptcy, on the other hand, is a legal declaration that causes the closure of the business. This is when the business has been in a prolonged state of insolvency and can't pay off its debts. Here, the business shuts and the firm's assets are sold to help creditors recover what they can. That concludes the key concepts for this topic. We recommend you use these steps as part of your study routine. Pay particular attention to steps two and three, as this is something overlooked by many BM students. Practicing case studies and developing application skills is the best way for you to improve your grade in BM, as all your school tests and the final exam are case study based. To practice these skills and access more detailed videos on BM content, please check out the resources on our website, diplomaly.org. If you need any support with any part of the BM course, including the IA or EE, feel free to get in touch with us via email or WhatsApp. Best of luck with your studying.